so long ago, somebody was texting me while I was driving. I didn't say I texted back. I heard a gasp there. But because I'm a conscientious driver, I gave my phone to my wife, and I said, do you mind responding to this person for me? And then I told her what to say, and she engaged this person in a short back-and-forth texting. Afterwards, I ran into this person, and I said, you should know that when you were texting me, you were actually texting my wife, and I was telling her what to say. And this person said, oh, I knew I wasn't texting with you. And I said, well, how could you tell? And she said, well, the message was laced with emoticons. I'm not one to use emoticons. It's too much work for me to find just the right emoticon, though I love the emoticon with the bald man and the glasses. I just wish there were one with a goatee as well. That would be perfect, wouldn't it? Don't you agree with me that sometimes emoticons are overused? Come on. Six emoticons in a row is a little excessive, isn't it? I was talking with somebody from Blessings this past Thursday about emoticons, and he reminded me that emoticons became necessary in an age of texting and email because You've had this experience, you receive a text from somebody, an email from somebody, and you don't really know whether the person is angry or happy. You don't really know whether the person is sincere or sarcastic. And emoticons help us when words are insufficient. And words are sometimes insufficient, and that's why we have Sacraments, it probably sounds tacky to say this, but in some sense, sacraments are God's emoticons to convey messages when words are insufficient. Now, don't you find also that there are some sometimes when there are no words to say, you find yourself in a challenging situation, maybe one that's very perplexing, very troubling. You're unable to express yourself in words, and all you can do is sigh. I suspect that when it comes to the things that concern us most in life, the things that are mon monumental in our lives, we often do not have words to speak. And God, of course, is very familiar with this phenomenon and we read about it in Scripture because you know that in Romans chapter 8, the Apostle Paul says that the Spirit of God joins with our spirit with sighs that are too deep for words. Sighs that are too deep for words. And sacraments, you should know, therefore convey something when mere words are insufficient and they convey messages that are too deep for words. Sacraments are actions, aren't they? They're actions that include words, but they convey more than words. And in connection with the Lord's Supper, for example, Jesus didn't say, say this in remembrance of me, or think of this in remembrance of me, but he said, do this in remembrance of me. And there's a variety of actions that are associated with the Lord's Supper. We are taking, and we are eating, and we are drinking. Now, in the sacrament of baptism, we aren't active the way that we are in the Lord's Supper, but there's still activity, isn't there? But we are passive in the sacrament of baptism. Something is done to us. We are baptized. Water is splashed on our heads, or perhaps we're immersed in water and then brought back out. What exactly is God communicating through baptism, you realize, of course, that we're going to get to 
the Lord's Supper in coming weeks. But what is God communicating through baptism? Well, I'm going to suggest to you that both sacraments are gestures of God's love, where God is conveying something words can't, where God is conveying something too deep for words. And I think that when we are baptized or when we witness a baptism, we're to recall all that the Bible says about water. And there are story after story about water in the Old Testament. And all of these stories point forward to the kinds of experiences we have as Christian believers. And we're to associate, the Bible says, those experiences with baptism. Let's think about how this works. So one of the texts in the Bible where Paul speaks most clearly about baptism is Romans 6, and that's why I chose that passage. Paul says, when we are baptized, we are joined to Christ, and we are buried with him in baptism, and we are raised with him to walk in newness of life. I don't know about you, but one of the passages that I recall when I think of that is Genesis chapter 1. Verse 2, the creation narrative where we read about the Spirit hovering, brooding over the face of the deep or the, over the face of the waters, ready to launch a new creation, ready to initiate new life. And if there is to be creation, if there is to be life, water is involved. Passage through water. So you can think of that, for example, Paul in Romans 6 also says when we are baptized into Christ, we are buried with him. And when we're buried with him in death, that means that death no longer has dominion over us. Death no longer has power over us. And I don't know if this does it for you, but for me that makes me think of the story of the flood. The boys and girls here probably are familiar with the story of Noah and the flood and what happened. Well, the human population became rebellious against God, and God was unhappy with that rebellion, and he determined he was going to punish the people, and he was going to punish them by means of a flood. But he covenanted with Noah and with his family and told Noah to build an ark, and in that ark, Noah and his family enjoyed safety in the threatening waters of God's judgment. And you can read about this connection in 1 Peter 3. And Peter tells us in 1 Peter 3 that in that ark, eight people were given safety through water. And then he follows that up with this baptism, which corresponds to this, he says, now saves you. So that's not a connection that I'm coming up on my own. Peter himself makes this connection between baptism and Noah and his family enjoying safe passage through water. So if you're going to experience a new creation, enjoy new life, if you're going to escape certain death, you have to go through water. As Noah and his family went through water, you can think of Moses. You remember when Moses was a baby, uh, Pharaoh had made this declaration that all the Hebrew boys should be killed. And poor Moses' mother didn't want to see her son uh, die, be killed. And so she created out of the reeds a little basket, put the basket in the Nile River. And you know the Hebrew word that's used for basket there in, what is it, Exodus chapter 2? It's the word ark. Because that little basket was an ark for Noah and it or for Noah for Moses, and it gave him safe passage through waters so that Moses could escape death. Paul says, when you're baptized into Christ, you're buried with Christ, and you're raised with Christ, and being buried with him in Christ's death. Paul says, means that you've died, and because you've died, you're now freed from sin. 
well, if you want to experience new creation and new life, and if you want to escape death, you've got to go through water. But the same is true if you want to enjoy freedom. And the Israelites in the Old Testament were in bondage in Egypt. And they had to go to the promised land through the wilderness. But in order to make it out of Egypt and into the wilderness, they had to go through the Red Sea, which Paul says in 1 Corinthians 10 was a baptism. In order for Israel to be a free people, she had to go through water. And then Israel spent all of those years in the wilderness. And when the time came to enter the promised land, what happened? What did Israel need to do in order to enter the promised land? Well, she had to confess her sins and pass through the Jordan River, which is also in the Bible connected to baptism. In fact, Jesus, we're told, was baptized in the Jordan River. He is the representative of God's people. John was baptizing people in that Jordan, polluting the Jordan River with the sins of people. Jesus stepped in that river, was baptized with those polluted waters as our representative. And yet we discover as we read through the Gospels that this was not the most significant baptism in the life of Jesus the most significant baptism in the life of Jesus would occur later on in his life. And you get passages like Luke chapter 12 where Jesus says, I'm very distressed about the baptism that I have to be baptized with. I'm very distressed about the fire that's about to be kindled. He use, uses both of those images in close proximity, doesn't, doesn't he? Well, what is that baptism that Jesus is going to undergo what is that baptism of which Jesus is so fearful? Well, he's referring to his death on the cross, isn't he? Because on the cross, Jesus experiences all those waters of God's judgment. You look at those psalms which, in which the psalmist talks about being engulfed in waters. That was the experience of Jesus on the cross being overwhelmed with the waters of God's judgment. But the waters of God's judgment did not destroy Jesus. And he rose three days later victorious. And Paul is saying to us, when you're baptized, you're baptized into Jesus in his death, and in his resurrection. And that means that everything that Jesus did that was anticipated by all these stories in the Old Testament, everything that Jesus did, he did for you. That's what's promised to you. And so there's a real sense in which we can say, I've been baptized in the Red Sea. And I've been set free from the dominion of sin. Do you see why Paul makes that connection in Romans 6? I've been set free like the Israelites, not from the slavery of Egypt, but from the dominion of sin. And I've gone through the waters of the Red Sea. I've been delivered from God's waters of judgment I have experienced the flood. I was in the ark, but the ark for me was Jesus. He who has died with Christ has died to sin. And I was there with the Israelites to enter the promised land, going through the Jordan River because of the work of Jesus. I can now inherit the kingdom of heaven, God's full kingdom. Do you see how the message that baptism conveys is too deep for words? Even as I talk about it, I find them a bit at a loss. 
It's so rich. It's so evocative. It's so overwhelming. It recalls all of history. But it points us in particular, doesn't it, to the Lord Jesus Christ and to the baptism that he experienced there on the cross. And you know, there is a sense in which the whole world is sacramental, isn't it? God is present in and through everything that we see around us and everything that we do. And it's special, you know, when we eat bread and wine at the Lord's table, but you know, it's special when we eat anything. And God uses food. He uses Big Mac and even French fries sometimes to keep us alive and to feed us. But you know, I think whenever we take a shower, whenever we take a bath, we should think of our baptisms and think of the spirit over the face of the waters and think of the waters of God's judgment at the flood and think of the waters of the Red Sea through which Israel was given safe passage and think of the Jordan River through which the people confessing their sins entered the promised land and think of the cross when Jesus was overwhelmed with the flood waters of God's judgment and we can say to ourselves, this is the status that God has promised me. And if that is the case, Paul says, you can't keep on living the way that you're living. If all of this is true for you, that you've escaped death, that you have new life, that you're a new creation, that you're given entrance into the kingdom of heaven, You've got to present your, your whole life as a living sacrifice. You've got to count yourself dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. So as you think about baptism, this amazing gesture of God's love, think of all the blessings that you enjoy through that water. But think of the responsibility that you have as well to live now as the person that God has set free, that God has delivered from death and the dominion of sin. Let's pray together. <clears throat> Gracious God, we have a tendency to downplay the sacraments and say, ah, oh, it's just baptism. It doesn't really mean much. It's just the Lord's Supper. It's a mere ritual that really doesn't change our lives. We ask you tonight to enlarge our perspective on the sacraments, to see how evocative water is, the waters of baptism in particular, and recall your deliverance of your people time and time again throughout the Old Testament and know that all of these deliverances point to the Lord Jesus Christ and all of them are promised to us. Help us tonight to celebrate our baptisms. Help us tonight if we're not baptized to look forward to our baptisms. Help us in seeing the value of our baptisms to recognize your love and to endeavor afresh with the grace that you provide to live like new, freed, delivered people. In Jesus' name, amen.